Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, where we are connecting Kill Team communities around the globe. Today, we're going down to Texas with our special guest, Chase. Welcome, Chase. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on, Chase. As the TO of the most recent FLG event, the Lone Star Open, we wanted to get get you on the podcast to talk a little bit about the burgeoning Texas community. For my part, having seen Kill Team come up since the beginning of this edition, I've talked to a handful of people from Texas on the discords, and it seems like Texas has had a very touch-and-go community uh, in general. I've heard a lot of people from Texas not able to find their local groups and having groups kind of implode over time, maybe due to travel or due to some other things. So it was really good to see that Texas had its own 16-person tournament recently with you as the head. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it, it touch and go is definitely the best way to describe the the scene how it's been. It feels like it started and stopped multiple times. Yeah, that's definitely what I've heard from some of the other people in the area. You know, at the Lone Star Open, you had Alakiko who on Discord who showed up, and he I met him at Kill Team Open, and it's, you know he did much better he, getting a third place finish at the 16 person tournament compared to his I think middle of the pack, lower middle of the pack at his first big showing so it was cool to see a name that i bumped into in real life back in the scene he switched over from legionary to crute and it sounds like crute did pretty well at the lone star open yeah definitely it, it was it was a little surprising to see two crute players in the top three uh i, yeah. I think the fact that all the terrain was was all open kind of can you know contributed to that quite a bit because you know whenever you're not doing into the dark you can kind of take more shooty teams and crute kind of plays into that yeah, Crute are a nice mixed team that can do a little bit of everything. And it sounds like your team, Skew, also is a team that can do a little bit of everything. She says here in our show notes that you started off as a Harlequin diehard and moved over to Corsairs over time. So it'll be nice to get an elf perspective on here because we haven't had a ton of elf players, right, Jason? That's absolutely true. Um, and I have definitely have been interested in Corsairs. And I actually just got a kit and I haven't built them yet, but I'm excited to. And I'm also excited to hear about your take, um, which is coming up later on in the episode. Just as a small hint for anyone interested in playing Corsairs, this is a generic advice for Corsair builders. Go online, look up Warhammer instructions on Reddit, and look up the Corsair build guide. Because the Corsairs are one of the worst kits that they've designed as far as <laughs> playing World's Waldo. So, Definitely. you know, for Jason and all the other prospective Eldar listeners, a quick, quick hint. <laughs> Yeah, that yeah, I, is, is definitely a bit of a nightmare. It is a it is a massive nightmare. But we wanted to get in Chase, and we wanted to talk about growing your local community because Texas is definitely one of those spots where I've heard of multiple attempts to like get something going. So we wanted to really shine a light on your efforts building up the Lone Star Open and how you got your local community working and how you know it's been going over the last couple months because it sounds like texas has had some issues so for any texas listeners who wanted to help shine a light on one of the communities that at least has flg support <laughs> right yeah definitely uh yeah texas has been a, an interesting scene uh since i'm located out of college station slash brian uh it's it's a little centrally located to to a lot of major cities like houston dallas austin uh san antonio all those are at most about three hour drive um so it's it's we're kind of like in the middle of everything, but we're also not a large enough city or town really uh, to to host like a huge tournament. But we've managed to get a lot of players coming in from other cities, coming to college at Texas A and M, and then once they kind of learn the game, I get them set up, and then once they go back home during the breaks or whatever, they start teaching other people. And I'm hoping that that's going to translate into you know a massive Texas kill team community, you know. Yeah. How big is the current local community? Because it sounds like you have a lot of college students in and out of the scene. So tell us a little bit about your player spread, age spread. You know, what are, what are people playing? Tell us a little bit about it. Oh, yeah. OK, so our our local community, we meet up at our one game shop, <laughs> um, which is Clockwork Games. It's a great little shop, really set up for wargaming. Uh, and they've got like a little area upstairs with just massive tables for wargaming, tons of terrain. It's great. Love it. Um but our local group of Kill Team players is something more like about 14 players, um, give or take, because people are constantly moving out of town. People are constantly coming in. Uh, so the largest tournament that I ran beforehand was was 14 people. And it was it was good. I mean, 
you know, I'm essentially providing most of the terrain and all this type of stuff. Um, except for, you know, shop has a bit of terrain, which is great. But were you doing uh, three rounds or four rounds with 14 people? We did one set of four rounds in a single day, and everybody was so exhausted by the end of that, we all agreed to never do it again. So <laughs> that's that kind of influenced what I ended up doing for Lone Star Open, which was we ran three rounds on one day and then the final round on Sunday. So it ended up being a two-day event. And just in case FLG wanted to add more tickets uh, and make it a 32 or 20-some-odd person event, we needed five rounds. Then I was like, all right, we can do two rounds on Sunday, and that'll kind of even out. But yeah, our local scene is uh, it's a lot of college students, obviously. Uh, Kill Team is just like very affordable to get into versus a lot of other wargaming uh, you know, games because you just simply buy a single little box and, and you're in it. You know, That's usually enough operatives to run, you know, even if it's a suboptimal team you're still in the game. Uh, so that appeals to, to college students who just don't have a ton of expendable income. But when it comes to like other age spread, I mean, we've got me, you know, I'm in my thirties. Uh, we got a couple of guys from my job uh, who are also, you know, late twenties, early thirties. And uh, I think that's, that's most of the community. We're pretty, pretty tight, like age gap. Um, and then every now and again, we get, you know, some, some, young folk coming in younger than 18 for example uh and they come in looking for a game to play and you know we we welcome them with, them with uh, open arms and teach them how to play do you does your uh, local squad have a weekly day to try to set up at the shop so that people can see that you guys are playing regularly because i know that's something that's worked reasonably well for me and jason just curious if you guys are doing something similar yeah i think that when it comes to like establishing a group or consistency is the number one thing that you need. Cause if people come to the shop and they go, Oh, are there kill team players here? And, and somebody just says, Oh yeah, they kind of show up every now and again, you know, then that makes it difficult. So initially we started off with every other Wednesday evening coming into the shop and playing until close. And, uh, we were cutting so close up to the closing time of nine o'clock that they decided they were going to stay open later for us, which was very awesome. Uh, and then it kind of turned into just every Wednesday, especially over the summer, you know, people got a lot more free time, especially college students. Uh, so they're looking for a weekly type game to get a lot of reps in and, you know, just get more into this game that they just learned about. So and like Wednesday the predictability is our, is our kind of, of having every single week I've noticed, cause I've tried every other week before and then just having it ex- every week just made it exponentially grow just cause it's super predictable. Mm-hmm. If someone can't make it every time, that's definitely something that I've noticed. Um, so, and then I'm a little bit curious about like, how far do people tr- like, uh, is everyone within like 30 minutes that shows up or do you get some people that like come in from further out from that? Or like the regular events, I mean, driving across college station, if there's no traffic or anything, it takes like 15 minutes. <laughs> it's, it's glorious in that aspect because small town, you know, you can zip around, uh, but when when we run tournaments, we got a couple of people who are driving in from like San Antonio, San Marcos, uh, one guy from North Houston. But there's like a portion of North Houston that's only about an hour away. So that's not too bad. And it's all highways. So you just zoom right up. If you drive fast, you get there 45 minutes. That sounds like a very Texas thing to say. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> only if the cuffs, only if the Arbides catch you. <laughs> can yeah, you not go? Yeah. Can you not make the 45? <laughs> Yeah, there, there's some brand new highways up there, like tollways and stuff like that, that, you know, everybody's just like, ah, there's no cops on here yet. Like, there's not a problem yet. How was the uh, community transfer between your local group to the Lone Star Open? Was it mostly one to one or did you get a couple more people from out where, like, you know, further around, further around? Yeah, so our local group, whenever the summer hit, you know, being a lot of college students, they all kind of went back home. So we had one guy go up to Dallas back home, one guy uh, over to San Antonio. And then we retained a couple of people. Um, but yeah, so when the actual tournament came around and I started you know, trying to recruit people, make sure we sold all of our tickets, uh, we ended up with about four or five local players uh, that ended up being in the tournament. So about a third <laughs> of everybody there was were, were people that I had played against and played with or taught or whatever. Uh, and then everybody else was surprisingly people that i'd kind of learned about through the community uh, i got plugged into a couple of different like groups in other towns to try to grow the scene a bit more so i plugged into a, a group out in houston called space city kill team and then uh, i got hooked up with the 
Dallas Wargaming Discord. And so I've been talking on there, you know, trying to keep them updated. Met some really great people that I'd been talking to online for quite a while. And uh but yeah, it was it was a good number of people that I'd never met before. A couple of people from out of state as well. We had a guy from Brooklyn, but his family's in Dallas, so he kind of did a double whammy. And yeah, one of my to... tournament players. Oh, really? Yeah, he come, he comes to mind monthly. He's been he's actually been playing since the beginning of the edition. He started on Space Marines, one of one of my per- Brooklyn hometown heroes. He's been a big part of running, helping us play in all of these events and stuff. So he's a friendly dude. He started on Space Marines and now he's on Crute. He played Blooded for a second. So anyone from Brooklyn, James, you know. He's out here getting second place at the Lone Star. I think he said his one loss was against the other Kinban player, which was a heartbreaker for him. Yeah, it, it was it was a really tight group, really tight competition, honestly. Uh, there was a lot of funny mirror matches that occurred as well. Like There was the Harlequins player played against Corsairs in one round. Uh, Pathfinders played against Vet Guard which was just oops all bodies like there was barely even room to move anybody because you know it's like what 26 14 and 12 operatives? 14 yeah, and 12 yeah. models yeah it's a big it's a big hard game uh it's actually one of on both sides one of their harder matchups so I would pathfinders imagine, versus yeah. Eckhart is yeah it's a rough matchup both ways any other hometown heroes for you it sounds like you know you've got a pretty wide audience or wide net of players so Who's your local hometown hero versus your traveling hometown heroes from the Lone Star Open? So uh, one of the people who has been there since I kind of started this whole thing, uh, basically, I I was trying to get into playing Kill Team, couldn't find a community. So I was like, I'll start one. Uh, but he's been there since since the get go over a year ago. We, we kind of started getting together and getting the local shop involved and getting things going, which is uh, Dylan Went. Uh, he's he's definitely one of the the best guys out there, super friendly. Uh, whenever I can't make it, the few times I haven't been able to make it to our weekly nights, uh, I usually shoot him a text and say, hey, we got some new players coming in who want to learn how to play the game. Can you get in there and teach them? And he's always happy to do it. He's the guy who designed our logo, our shirts. Like He's, he's a real one. That's great. Yeah, having extra people in the community step up after you've put in the work definitely is a nice feeling and one of the reasons why starting your own local Kill Team community, I think, has, can be very rewarding, especially if you're in maybe an area with uh, some trouble starting the community. But it does come with some downsides of some, maybe some slow nights, right, Chase? Oh, definitely, yeah. There, there's There's been a, a couple of times when you go to the shop and there's just one person there and you're like, oh, let's just talk shop, you know? <laughs> Yeah, so then I'm yeah. I'm a little curious with the with the like you've started it up, it's fizzled out a little bit. Were you involved in every phase, and have there been any trends that you've noticed on on why it fizzled out in the first place? That is something that you've learned from and overcame. That so I don't know if if like if there was a community beforehand that I you know came in and started kind of stirring up, and that's kind of what helped contribute to it. Uh, I just I decided that I wanted to start playing the game uh, after you know I was getting into 40k and then I was like eh, well, I like squad based skirmish stuff and uh, so I decided on kill team and at that time it was still the previous edition uh, so I was I was getting into that I was getting prepped to go to LVO uh, last year which I believe was the first year that Dakota ran it if I recall correctly and uh, he he they they had switched the rules over from the the previous edition to the current edition and. You know, at that point, I was like, well, I got to learn this new game now, I guess, because uh, it is quite different. I don't know if you guys have played the old one. I played the old one. It is not at all a similar game in terms of gameplay. <laughs> the only thing that remains for anyone who has played the old edition that doesn't play this edition and listens here for whatever reason is basically the stats, like the armor saves, the ballistic skill and the weapon skill. That's basically the only thing that travels over and everything else is kind of up in the air. Yeah, yeah. So I was... Uh... You know, transferring over, learning this new game, and as I said, I just, I just didn't have any anybody to really like game with. Well, I did up in Dallas, but you know, driving three and a half hours to go, you know, play a game for a bit, and then driving three and a half hours back, you know, I turned it into like a weekend trip, and then you know, then we ended up doing other stuff, and then Kill Team just kind of fell to the wayside. Um, but yeah, so I I don't know really what's caused the scene to fizzle, except for I think most scenes just need like a really strong personality to just kind of glue everybody together and get communications going. So whenever I got plugged into like the local discord uh, for the BCS wargaming discord, 
they had a Warhammer 40k section and then they had like an other games section. And so anytime <laughs> I was posting questions and stuff, they were like, oh, this isn't really 40k. Can you post this in other games? And I was like, can I get a Kill Team Discord like section? And they were like, yeah, we'll, we'll put one in there. Next thing you know, you've got people hopping into that part of the Discord because, you know, they're in the Lord of the Rings section or they're in the bolt action section. And then they go, oh, what's, what's this Kill Team thing about? And then next thing you know, I'm talking to them setting up a demo game, you know? Yeah, I've actually I actually had the exact same thing happen when I first started doing stuff out of my local shop at the Brooklyn Strategist. We had a Discord that someone who didn't use the internet as much set up and they said they wanted everything in one channel. I was like, that is insane. Split up your <laughs> channels. So for anyone out there who's you know starting a Discord, make sure to have some organization. It doesn't have to be so explicit as like 40k here, AOS here, everything here. It could be as much as sci-fi army sci-fi small scale just to like give people different hooks to like organize their thoughts because having a lot of crosstalk makes the first sets of communication that much harder on big discords or even in small local discords yeah definitely uh yeah so i mean all this stuff has kind of led to me making my own little team discord the engage party repeat is like our local club that we started uh it's just like an open team so if anybody from texas is like I want to put a team name down whenever I sign up for a tournament. You know, that's you can put engage party repeat. We'll, we'll welcome you with open arms. Um, but yeah, so I started my own little discord just to kind of like kick comms out there whenever I start hosting larger tournaments in College Station, because that's my ultimate game plan is to host things, you know, 16 up to 32 player tournaments in a city that's very central. People can do a quick day trip, drive two hours, play in a tournament drive two hours it'll be a long day but you know they can get home and time for a late dinner but yeah yeah so i started my own little one just just for comms but really not to talk shop too much but i'm you know over time who knows exactly where it'll go but at this point i'm i think i'm on about like six different discords just for kill team just to kind of like make sure i reach all the communities yeah i mean we have just another discord for ju- <laughs> for our own <laughs> channel so you know, for anyone who doesn't know, join our Discord so you can chat with me, Jason, and soon Chase here on the Discord. Ask about the... We actually have a lot of TOs on our Discord, which is nice, and some burgeoning TOs. So you can get help for rules questions and all the other stuff. And we have a couple... Compet- we have more than a few competitive people hanging around the Discord. So if anyone wants to join and ask questions, talk to us, feel free. Yeah, and that can even be things like um, other tips on running events and sourcing terrain and any kind of logistical stuff or like um innovative tactics whatever you want to do um join the discord and chat about it yeah so i wanted to bring it all bring it back around to maybe some of the more competitive stuff now with a new section titled the peanut butter and jelly of your specific team so instead of an operative showdown we're going to test out this format a little bit so chase has mentioned that he's been playing void dance or void scarred corsairs quite a bit so i wanted to ask what makes you stick to the team and what do other players get jealous of when they see you play your team because i think it's a nice way to think about what makes a team fun because it's like the thing that makes brings you there but the thing that people get, complain about basically on the other side <laughs> definitely uh okay so yeah the for the peanut butter the 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 sticky part uh, I like Corsairs because they're high damage and high speed. Uh, you know, I, I like to get in fast and, and put my opponents on the back foot. I'm in everything that I play, like every game, I'm usually very strategically aggressive and not just suicidally aggressive. Uh, so obviously Vord Dancer Troop does that very well, extremely fast with fly. You're just ignoring terrain, but with Corsairs, You've still got the the free dash, which makes you feel like a de facto three APL team, you know, because with Harlequins, I'm usually using a dash almost every single turn. So it gives you a lot of strategic options, keeps you moving. Uh, I like the fact that they have ranged weapons, which is something that <laughs> that I've extremely struggled with with Void Dancer Troop, because if you're one ranged, one and a half ranged operatives go down, then there's some matchups that you really just can't win. At least that's how I feel. Uh, And then they've got a lot more tricks that you can pull out. Like Void Dancers, once you know them, once you've played against them or used them enough, you kind of know that 
their few tricks, you know exactly what they are, where they're coming, when they're coming. You know, if your opponent has is like out of uh, command points, then then there's really not a lot that you have in your bag that you can, you know, sneak up on people. Sure. But yeah. Void dancers have, you know, the basic tools of domino field, which is hard to shoot outside of six inches. They've got Craig Rix's chest so that they're hard to strike in melee, but not as bad as they used to be. Mm-hmm. And then they've got their say deaths, which basically telegraph what their spiky game plan is going to be, whether or not they're going to get extra retains on melee or better defensive profiles against shooting. So there is a lot that is forward telegraphed when you're playing Void Dancer Troop that, you know, for Void's card Corsairs, you can be a lot muddier with your initial placements because of those nine inches and the mix of range and shooting threats. Definitely. And then also you've got healing, which is, you know, kind of helps you keep your operatives alive because that, you know, nine wounds, I believe they pack uh, or eight eight wounds, eight wounds, eight wounds. And then your, your one leader is a nine wound operative. That's right. Yeah. The fell arc. Um, I think void dancers get three or uh, the Harlequins get three of them. Basically all the, the hero characters. Yeah, all the special ones. So, I mean, with eight wounds, you're surviving some shots, but you're going to be injured most of the time if you do get shot at. Uh, So having somebody who can heal keeps you on the board a little bit better. Uh, And then they've also got a couple of silent options, which is always nice. You know, that's something that's tough to deal with if you're a slow team and you're facing somebody who's got silent and, you know, are able to kind of hit and run. It's, It's hard to deal with. I I really like your uh, talking about being strategically aggressive. Uh, I did during a, one of the road trips with a friend of mine. Uh, while we were driving back, we were just talking about corsairs, and um, that was pretty much my takeaway. I I was like, if I'm going to play corsairs, I'm going to play every single one of these models is a missile, and then they just like run out and do as much damage as possible. And then you just want to get positions to get your angles to missile into whatever you want and like try to set it up non-reciprocally with all your fast movement and the shooting and the lone operative and all the crits and everything. And it's, it's, I've been interested and I'm, you know, maybe soon I'll, I'll start playing some Corsairs. Definitely. There's just some, some really nasty tricks, like the one fly operative who's pretty nasty in melee, you know, you can, be behind a piece of terrain and your opponent doesn't really expect you to be able to do anything. And you're like, Oh yeah, this guy's got to fly. I'm going to fly over this building and charge you, you know, uh, things like that. And then, uh, what I like to do is I, I move, uh, I don't have all their names memorized, but since they most mostly have power swords, you know, they're, they're pretty solid in melee. Uh, so long as you're on the offense and not the defense, cause you're going to take that first hit most of the time. Uh, I like to move up with the with the melee operatives, get them on objectives, and start clearing my opponent off of objectives. You know, try to force them to be like, "All right, I'm I'm in your zone. I'm on your objectives. You've got to push me off," or set up a, a spot to where if they do get an objective, first turn, second turn, you know, I'm in a in a position to where I can charge and take out that operative. And then the entire time, I'm you know utilizing just combined arms tactics and keeping a bunch of guys back with good sight lines to just cover those operatives. So that way. Essentially, you make just a bunch of danger lanes for your opponents <laughs> where they're they're staring down either uh, somebody who's going to shoot them or somebody who's going to fight them. And that just, you know, putting that much mental load on your opponent is is usually where you can kind of get some people to fold because they're just like too many things that can happen in this turn. And, you know, they're going to make mistakes. So what makes your opponents jealous when they look at your team or what like gets people the most riled up when they when you're piloting the Corsairs outside <laughs> of these firing lanes? Yeah, it's it's got to be just the damage output. Uh, the, the times whenever I, I get into melee and they're like, oh, they've just got a sword. It'll be all right. It turns out this sword, you know, it's a power weapon or something like that. Uh, I had one guy who literally just kind of stared down across the table and was like, how are they all good at melee? You know? just kind of blown away by it. And I was like, well, one guy has to hit you with this gun. I mean, that's all he's got, but you know, you're really not going to get to that guy. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's just the insane damage output. And then also having nine operatives. So all of my local players are used to me playing Harlequins. So whenever I was like, Oh, Corsairs, I get one more operative. Everyone is like, Oh, they'll be weaker. And it turns out, no, they're not. Yeah. They're definitely not substantially weaker. The one big problem that I've seen for the voice car Corsairs is that they run into dice reliability issues because you're rolling four dice so often 
compared to teams that get to roll five dice a handful of times. And in melee, you know, four attacks on threes, even with a power sword, always going to land what you need to, especially against maybe more elite operatives. So have you, how, how have you worked around that, that issue? Um, so I, I like to set up what, what I, what I call just kind of like guaranteed moments, you know, uh, it works better when you have nine operatives versus the the eight operatives of Void Dancer Troop, where, you know, I'll use somebody that I know can put out a decent amount of damage, so like a shuriken pistol or something like that, and just get some hits on my opponent. You know, it's not going to kill them, but it's going to get them down enough. And then I, once I know how many wounds I've already taken off, then I can start calculating with dice probabilities and things like that, how many more operatives it's going to take, and who do I have in position to take that person out. You know, so. I assume that that's just something that like everybody thinks about, but whenever I can set up a position to where I get somebody down to, uh, you know, four or six wounds left, then I know that if I charge and I get a hit, then I know I'm going to take them down. And if I've got lethal five up, I've got, you know, a one third chance, which is pretty good on four dice of getting that, that lethal five up, getting that six damage and taking them out without them being able to, you know, do anything back. So I like to try to set up those moments where I'm taking a I'm still there's still probability. There's a chance for me to roll all ones and just cry, you know. But what I'm really relying on is is the probabilities coming through and being able to just hit somebody before they can hit me back. And well, at that point they've lost an operative and now they gotta shoot this guy. So I assume the leader's coordinate is it coordinated strike mm-hmm. is very critical to that overall strategy. Yeah, so it's it's definitely it's really useful for that. Uh, there, there's also a really nasty thing that I like to do. If you're familiar with the the Pathfinders and their uh, their kind of like alpha strike long range grenade strategy, you can essentially do the same thing with Corsairs. And uh, I learned this because I was playing. We have a local guy Ben who plays Pathfinders, and his favorite thing every single game turn one I'm gonna do this long range snaky grenade guy, you know, hit you in your deployment zone with a blast effect. And it's just, it's always devastating. It's never fun. Um, but it's hilarious to me. I laugh, laugh, you know, hysterically, but I, uh, when I started playing Corsairs, I, I realized that I essentially have the same option in a weird way. It's, it's hard to, to explain it. I actually tried to write it out for this podcast. Uh, and it's like a page of text, <laughs> But basically, you you utilize uh, you give the fell arc a grenade, and then you have the and you have them on engage turn one. You move them up with your recon scouting, and then you use uh, oh, what is the one? It's is it the psyker plunderers? Yeah, where, where you can yeah you can move up three inches, and then uh, if you get initiative. Well, you're ready to go. But if you don't get initiative, you use one step ahead and just redeploy into safe zones. But the idea is that you start with the fell arc, you move them up. Uh, since you've already moved six inches up to start the game with, and then you move six inches more, 12 inches, you know, six inch grenade toss. You, you've got a pretty solid effective range of what, 18 inches. Uh, and then if you need to, you could also dash forward and get 21 inches, which means that you're going to hit if you're on like the the short board that means you're going to hit on the 22 inch board you basically can guarantee a strike almost anywhere from the center of the board precisely so yeah it's it's a dirty move and then since the fell arc moved you use coordinated strike on your way seeker who's in conceal and you move them up behind them and you get kind of into cover and then you use the uh their psychic power warp fold and you swap positions so now your fell arc is no longer directly in front of your opponent you know right in front of their deployment zone you get them into kind of a safer spot and then you get your uh your way seeker if you still have a dash left then dash into some more cover now your opponent has to like move up and try to deal with these threats and then the the best part of it the the absolute cherry on top is when you use plunderers you get to move three people so i always take my if i'm playing like a horde team for example or against a horde team i'll take my uh shredder gunner who has blast on him and then have him kind of come out into the the forefront. Then second activation, I take him, move him up, and just hit one of those same operatives and just cause that same blast effect again. I deleted like five novitiates in a single game on by my second like turn activation, but my total third activation. 
I don't think I had looked much at coordinated strike. What does that one do again? So if you activate the uh, fell arc within, th you can activate somebody else immediately after within three inches. So you kind of get two activations in one turn. It's like Breach and Clear or Hunter Clay, but less flexible than both because it has to be your leader and it has to be someone within three inches of them. Breach and Clear is anyone, any pair within three inches, and then Hunter Clay is within three inches of the leader. Any group, any op any pair of operatives can do it. So it's more restrictive, but you know, in these situations when you're getting a grenade chuck or just <laughs> lining up the, you can actually do it to line up the warp fold into a better spot or just to save a model at the last minute. So. It can be. It is. It is very powerful. I think one of my teammates had marked up most of the in the dark maps so that you can line up a blaster or a shredder shot into the back line on a lot of maps with the warp fold shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, because you can move up, have the warp fold go off, and then the person that gets moved up now can open the door, then take a normal move, and then take a shot because you can warp fold out from your deployment relatively easily. Yeah. Yeah. It's. It's a. It's one of those tricks where I kind of looked at it and I was like, okay, swapping position, that, that's kind of handy. But uh, back when I played d and I played a, a wizard that had basically the same like tactic. And so being able to use that in kill team, I was like, oh, I, I know a lot of stuff with this. You know, you can get real tricky with it. Yeah, you can get very, very tricky with it. Uh, I'm curious if you've ever tried the grenade on the, the flying operative. Pros and cons. Oh, uh, actually, I, I haven't. Usually, I'm I'm trying to keep that guy in conceal because he's got that silent knife attack, and I'm usually running recon, so I'm trying to get that operative into my opponent's backfield uh, because I can keep him in conceal. He flies over terrain; he can get there quickly, and then you know. Meanwhile, I've got eight other operatives who are all just you know giving my opponent a problem. They're usually not super worried about this one guy. He's got like a six inch or three inch. I can't remember. I think it's six six inch knife attack that doesn't do a ton of damage they also have the the thing where you if you pass by somebody you can slash them if i recall correctly yeah slicing attack if you take a normal move and you pass your engagement range with your flyer he like phases it out of the warp for a second and just gives him a little stab yeah little you just roll one stab. die and if it if yeah. it hits <laughs> got relentless so, you know four you get two two chances to hit a three and then it can crit which is nice so I think yeah. on In the Dark, my teammate has mentioned a couple times that the Shade Runner, which is the Warp Generator backpack, can effectively play like five APL on In the Dark specifically with uh, Deadly Plunderers because you can take a move through someone, stab them, which is kind of uh, two actions. You can open a door for free and then you can also still shoot or still... Uh, you can also do it through a door to get in range for a... Um, for a hatchway fight range for a hatchway fight yeah so you can pass through them stab them on the way through end up on the other side hatchway fight them and then shoot someone for real so, <laughs> and you could do that yeah yeah which is a uh, oh, real man. crazy because you can like move stab <laughs> do a shoot action kill the person and then hatchway fight someone else which is which can be yeah, the, the door shenanigans on into the dark have have always been interesting i i think one of my favorite things that i saw that I performed and I just laughed hysterically was I was playing a I was playing as Harlequins on Into the Dark against Legionary, which is a fairly bad matchup. Yeah, like it's I, a rough I one. Gotta, yeah. So I had put my fusion pistol on one room on the far left that was just like a huge open room with just like a single like tiny wall in the middle, like an eye, you know? And it it just doesn't there's no cover in there. So it's just an absolute slug fest. So I put my uh my fusion pistol guy in there. And then I think just like a regular player and my opponent had moved up a, uh, it was a, a loot mission. So I kind of had advantage there, but he'd moved up his anointed, which was the guy, you know, where he can turn into the monster, but the meter, but then he can't perform mission actions. Well, he had moved that guy up and he was, it was looking like next turn. He'd already killed a guy. And so I had my fusion pistol guy left and I was like, I might be able to get the shot off and kill him, but it wasn't guaranteed, and I'd already looted that objective out, except for like maybe one time. I was like, well, he can't score mission actions anyways, and it was just fusion pistol and anointed in that one room. So I just ran out and closed the door. So now he's stuck in this room. He can only score one point. And, well, he can't actually score the point on loot because he can't oh, do yeah, the mission action. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So, so he's just he's standing just in there. He's locked with... in there. <laughs> so yeah, we, yeah. We, we always call that guy the dog, so we're like, yeah, we, we locked the dog in timeout. Pretty good, actually. I've never actually house. seen yeah. 
I think we, a lot of us on the internet had like theorized like, oh yeah, at some point it's probably going to happen, but I've never actually seen it. So bravo. No, thank you. For, for leading the bull straight into the, uh, the empty room as it were. <laughs> I, I sacrificed a Harlequin for it, but it, it was a valiant effort. So I'm curious, uh, in your community, where are you getting your Kill Team content from? I know, you know, you're on a podcast right now, but obviously as a smaller community group, where have you been finding most of your Kill Team news? Have you been doing most of it, like, just playing? Or tell us a little bit about it. So obviously, uh, you know, I'm, tr- I'm trying to keep, like, engaged with my community to keep them interested in the game and looking forward to what's what's coming out. So obviously, I, I follow the Warhammer community, uh, like, news stuff. Whenever something comes out, I always toss it up on on the local Discord and kind of chat about it and get people excited. Um, aside from that, I've always been a huge fan of Goonhammer's articles. Their Kill Team content is just like top tier. I'm much more of like a reader than I am like a like a you know like a person who watches videos or something like that. I just don't retain the information. It's like it's nothing against those content creators; they work really hard, but my brain just doesn't jive with it. <laughs> so, uh, but. You know, on that topic, I will say that I do. Uh, I follow Can You Roll a Crit, John Reese. You know all of his stuff, and uh, there's a couple of articles that he'll put out where he, you know, mentions like, "Oh, the video explains this better," and I'll be like, "All right, I'll watch this video. You got me." But <laughs> but between those two, that that's really most of where my or those two plus the Warhammer community, which I mean, that's just like a default. Uh, between yeah, you've those, you've got to set a new hype, right? You've got to you got to keep on top of that stuff. But yeah, aside from that, that's that's really like the two things. So whenever I uh, get an opportunity to to look into Goonhammer stuff or whenever I see a new thing posted on there, it's always the first thing that I go to. I'm like, ooh, new article. Have you been running into any issues on maybe the lack of hype right now on the current Kill Team news scene just because 10th seems like it's been eating up most of GW's attention? Yeah, it's it's been a combination of things. You know, you've got, You've got Tenth coming out. You've got uh, Cultists, and then right before that, Felgor Ravagers came out. So you've got all these things that people were like really bummed about in the current meta, and talking about ways to kind of help and mitigate that and fix that. And aside from that, we're all anxiously waiting for season three. You know, everybody's speculating as to what it's going to be and how it's going to play. And in my specific community, we've got a, a good bit of. Uh, into the dark kind of fatigue you know we've uh, right around when our team or our scene started kind of coming up and getting a lot more established is right when that season came out so most people's like huge exposure to kill team has been into the dark and whenever we run tournaments we do mixed terrain here locally just because that's how we can provide enough terrain uh so everybody's been playing on it everybody's kind of kind of tired of it you know I still enjoy it, but but aside from that, everybody's it's definitely not the same game when you play on in the dark compared to open because it I my personal opinion has always been it feels like the teams are balanced on open and not for in the dark specifically outside of maybe like breachers breachers felt like they were really good on in the dark, but nothing else has really felt particularly good on those close confines. Yeah, some might say that breachers were a little bit too good when they came out on the close (laughs) confines. So yeah, definitely. I mean. Poor, poor Crute there at the beginning. They they had a bit of a tough spot until they got just absolutely life injected into them. <laughs> yeah, they had a big makeover. People are they're excited about season three, so we just kind of keep talking about that. And uh, right now, since I just ran, you know, LSO, everybody in the local community at least is is excited about what's coming next. So the the game plan going forward is to run monthly tournaments, as I've probably mentioned. Um, but the the other part of that game plan is to is to make sure that we're doing stuff that's as big as as uh as lso on like the prize support aspect of it so Mm -hmm. before it's just you you, like you know been like little affordable tournaments and then all that converted into store credit but if we're getting a bunch of people from out of town especially you know that don't shop at our one game shop uh then we're, we're looking to kind of expand that get you know trophies and prizes as i said just like we had at lso get some some real price support in there some new boxes of of gear terrain and stuff for people to to win which that's gotten people pretty excited 
There's a, for what it's worth, uh, locally we do dog tags and I found that to be a nice little kind of like midway prize point. We do the store credit, um, mostly because our store is mostly a 40 K store. So we actually have enough product and stuff to keep on the shelves. Plus, you know, you can buy drinks and stuff with the credits. So sometimes Mm. people just convert it into beer for fun. Um, (laughs) but dog tags, we have like monthly dog tags that we use. So it's like, uh, I think first three best sport, best painted every month just as like a nice little thing it's like 80 bucks for like a year's supply basically oh wow yeah which is not too bad so in case you want to try that i know the players locally you know anyone who wins one they just show up kind of on their kill team bags like people show up (laughs) with their bags jangling around with a bunch of dog tags so heck yeah that's a really killer idea actually i didn't think about that one instead of going for like really big trophies you know just something that is a little bit more low-key that might be a little bit of New York talking where it's like, I don't really want to have space for a trophy rack in New York. But right. I do think so, like it's it's gone over well locally. What we did uh, for for Lone Star Open is uh, I got linked up with Dakota Luster, who operates Luster's Workshop out of California. And uh, he and I have been talking very close, especially whenever I started dialing up to kind of work on LSO. Uh, and since he's the LVO TO and you know, has his own laser cutter and does amazing designs and a lot of, he's just a killer guy. <laughs> he's, he's been a huge resource for me, but uh, he hooked us up with, with trophies, uh, which are like little medallions, like hexagonal. And they've got like an engraved bid on them and they're, they've got magnets on the back. So they're about the size of like a credit card, you know, but they're like, they're thick. And then uh, you can, they've got magnets on them, so you can make like a little wall board or something like that. Or stick it near your fridge if you really wanted to, you know? Yeah, like, mine mine from Kill Team Open 2023 is on my fridge. There you go, but, yeah. Yeah, my one for the previous year is sitting at my local shop because it was a little oh. bit bigger. But, you know, speaking of Dakota, he's our, he is, remains our sponsor for the podcast. Nice. And if you want to get a sick, just another Kill Team gauge, find out the keyword from chase at the end of the podcast today so jason if you want to get us into our final section for the day yes so the final section for the day is niche tactics niche tactics we kind of talked a little bit about uh dabbled in this a little bit earlier but i'm sure that we can pull some more out talking about the void dancer troop and um anything else that we didn't cover Uh, do you play hand of the archon at all no no i'm you know, at this point, I've got too many kill teams. I've, <laughs> I've got, I've got four. You know, so I started with Hunter Clade. I got Vet Guard. Uh, I gave some away, and then I settled with you know my two elf teams. So I'm, I'm kind of buckled down, and I just play those uh, because you know I want to learn them inside and out. I want to be good with them, and uh, I'm not one of those people who likes to pick up and and try. Well, I like to pick up and try different games, but when it comes to teams, I'm like. As you can tell from me talking about this already, I'm like, oh, I don't I don't know the name of this operative. He's the guy with the two swords, you know. So <laughs> I want to get to know it better to where I know the names of stuff. And I when I refer to something, people know what I'm talking about, not just pulling weird names out of my ass. When it comes to when it comes to maybe the niches of the Void Dancer tree, we have a pop quiz. What are the three kinds of melee weapons and what are their <laughs> abilities? Oh, okay. So you've got the uh, the caress, which uh, I just ignore. I pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, there's actually four because there's the embrace, yeah, which is question. Has, has brutal, right? And then uh, the blade, which is the only one I really rely on unless I'm playing against seven moon models, because uh, the blade is has balance five, you know, attacks. I believe it's four five damage, and then the uh kiss is three seven no special rules so it's kind of all you can give it special rules right monofilament wire i think is for the three seven profile uh three yeah is it uh, i think it 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 better four seven i think it's upgraded to four seven it's yeah it's plus one normal damage yeah, well, and, that shows me what I know about the elves because I do not know them clearly. And then the big reason for the kiss is he used the Sadaths for the uh, auto retain a crit on someone, especially if you've got it team wide, and then you just run up and auto crit someone with a seven damage kiss, and it just instant kills mm-hmm. people without any chip yeah. damage. Instant blender. Yeah, yeah, it's it's super important for you know whenever you're facing off against seven wound teams because you've got to find a way to get their operative countdown, and you've got to do it fast, and you've only got one crappy grenade and then you've got torrent 
on the uh, death jester if you want to spend two ap to to make that shot otherwise it's fusillade and so you just don't have a lot of good ways to deal with lots of operatives yeah you've got you know your grenade run with your prismatic grenade which is nice and you have your torrent which is very very hard to pull off because torrent requires you to have full line of sight on all models and they all have to be within two two inches of each other which is a yeah. lot of steps before you can get a torrent off so it's generally not the easiest to use so yeah you got to find lots of ways to get a two for one with your models on void dancer troop do you have any specific plays that you go to time and time again for your two for ones on the void dancers uh i mean i just it's all to me about positioning um my standard play is essentially i uh well first off i never give the fusion pistol to anybody who's just not a normal player you know I, i'm not really looking for that two up i'm I'm fine with a three up you know so i, I give the fusion pistol and uh the neuro disruptor to just like two regular players and uh and then aside from that i mean everybody else like my my leader just has a, a regular shuriken pistol power weapon uh but yeah, so so my big reliance is on is on just like sheer positioning tactics. So I like to move four guys up. So usually fusion pistol and three regular players with a shuriken pistol and a, a blade. And they're gonna be pushing forward, pressuring my opponent, and then uh my backfield is going to be my leader operative, death jester, shadow seer, and my neuro disruptor on a regular player. So the whole goal is to try to set up the 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 like ultimate kind of uh, combo move, which is where you can set up a, a charge, fight, and then a shoot. So especially if you're playing a horde team, that's kind of easy to set up, and that can get you that can get you a two for one, you know. But the shuriken pistol is not super reliable. It gets the job done, but it's just it's a lot easier to kill people with, with melee weapons. It sure is. Especially the seven wound models that you're targeting, because mm. generally they just don't have enough wounds to make it through more than two attacks, even with the you know your even with your weakest profile. So definitely. So it's just it's one of those things that uh, I don't really have any special tricks, which is kind of one of the reasons I, I moved away from Void Dancer Troop. Also, just because you know they've got kind of a, a stink on them, where everybody's like, "Oh, you're just winning because of this," and I was like, "Well, I don't think I am." So I. I <laughs> kind of set out to to try to prove some people wrong and switch to Corsairs. And, you know, I've only played about four or five matches with Corsairs, but I haven't lost a single one. And I've usually won pretty handily. But I, I mostly attribute that to the fact that, like, nobody at our shop plays them. Nobody at our shop really knows too much about them. So it's like this whole new thing that they're seeing. And so, again, now I've got to kind of get everybody used to them and then I can start winning games and then I can kind of put that chip on my shoulder. For for the Void Dancers, do you have a specific Sadeth like set that you go into? Because I know for a lot of players that play them a lot, there's basically like at the beginning, if you're playing against a shooting army, you put the defensive buff on so you can move your operatives into range, and then you have the leader switch up as you go into melee so that you can get your free kills. Some people just stay in tragedy the whole time so they can get their free retain on getting shot at because it allows them to run, you know, between colors. Or not between colors. Uh, basically, just add all the shooting debuffs onto mm -hmm. your opponents as much as possible. So you get a free retain. You get balanced on defense. So it's just that much harder for you to get killed by shooting. Which means that you have to fight you fight the Quins in melee. Which is much, much harder for mm -hmm. pretty much all teams. So have you? do you have like a specific set of Sadists that you look at? Um, I mean, usually I, I kind of start on tragedy. Just because at some point you're going to get shot at. <laughs> uh, and so... That's kind of my my bread and butter there. But whenever I start getting up into, uh, you know, like turning point two, turning point three, that, that's when I do start kind of looking at other ones. And I, I think it kind of just depends. Um, obviously, if I'm, if I'm playing what, you know, like a horde team or something like that, I'm going to try to do the ones where, you know, I kill somebody in two or less shots. Uh, those types of ones. I don't know. I, I think it's just entirely situation dependent. I haven't really settled on ones that I'm like, oh, this is easy to, to get all the doodads on. I've mostly just kind of played it by situation. Uh, and I've read a lot of like people's opinions on which ones are good and easy, but I don't know. It just doesn't seem to jive with my brain super well. So I've been kind of just playing around with it. I also like don't usually hit the, the like four performances or, 
you know, performance tally thing every single game. I'm I feel like that's more of like a it's handy when it happens, but I don't go like way out of my way because I'm mostly trying to focus on just getting points and that doesn't really help me score points. It's an interesting perspective for sure. I think that most people that I've seen tr- actively go for the four points just because an extra command point is really nice, but I don't know how often people are still doing it. I assume that most players are still hitting it locally, but I haven't been paying attention to their game. So at Atlantic City Open, I don't know how many of the players actually finish their Sabiths. So it might just be that right now you're so able to score points. Talking about scoring points, you know, which archetypes are you using that you have access to? Because you have access to Seek and Destroy, Infiltration, and Recon. And all of them are good at different reasons. So like, tell us about like when you use one or the other. So I usually rely on Recon whenever I'm facing a team that I'm trying not to get into fights with or I'm trying to really just focus fire. So that's going to be your elite teams. That's going to be your legionaries. That's going to be custodies if, you know, for some horrible reason you're playing against them and haven't just conceded before the game starts. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, things like that. That matchup yeah. is really hard. Four, yeah. four dudes with 18 wounds and four up invulns able to two shot you in melee and yeah. being able to double fight double shoot yeah basically matchup is almost impossible for void dancer troop um yeah, it is possible but, but it, it's rough you got to shoot them a lot <laughs> yeah i managed to tie against them the the last time i played them and it was on into the dark and i basically just played like it was like a benny hill s- sketch or something where they're running after me or like a uh, around one side of the map and i'm just going the opposite way and we're just like literally going around the entire map and just grabbing each other's objectives constantly and uh yeah whenever we finally ended uh i i don't know we were so just like tied up in like our two activations that we had left and trying to make sure that we didn't shoot each other's operatives off the board that we ended up just kind of both being in like a weird position and tying the game and we're like well that was fun but, so do you uh, use infiltration or seek and destroy at all then? Or it sounds like seek and destroy would be for the horde matchups, but yeah, maybe not infiltration as much. Yeah, I, I don't really. I used to use infiltration on the previous set of tech ops. I thought it was really good then. Uh, and I've seen people have a lot of success with it lately with like the uh, the one with the barricade where you just take an opponent's barricade or have control of it. I think that one's pretty handy depending on your board setup and everything. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, infiltration, whenever they switch the tack ops over, it's just been really tough for me to nail. But Seek and Destroy is kind of just like an instant gimme on any type of 7-wound, 8-wound team, just because you know that you're going to be getting those kills pretty reliably. Yeah, being able to line up your strategic uh, overview with your tack ops definitely allows you to score your tack ops a little bit more easily. I know I've seen some players kind of struggle with looking at how to score their secondaries, but if you're Overall strategy for approaching the game is not going to sync up with your secondaries. It will run into issues. For example, if you need to kill all of the elites, then maybe recon is not going to be as good because maybe you don't have enough operatives to actually spend time or enough actions to spend time doing recon stuff instead of shooting your opponent down. Because I know, you know, maybe for Kasserkin, it might actually be better for you to just seek and destroy your opponent's elites because you're not going to beat them in a fair fight. They move just as fast as you. So maybe sometimes you just want to line up those trades. Or if you're going to be playing Casterkin or Corsairs in a very aggressive mindset, then maybe Recon is going to do less work because you'll have to sacrifice either moving into those spots to score those secondaries or killing an operative which you need killed and just not, not getting points. So there's maybe a little bit of push and pull there. So it sounds like, you know, at least when you're playing Void Dancer Troop, you can play Recon when you want to avoid the enemy because... 12 wounds, 12 wounds with good melees and have to kill an 8 wound model, which is a little yeah. bit scary. And then seek and destroy when you know that at a huge model disadvantage or huge model disparity, you're going to have to spend some operatives to go remove opposing pieces. So that's Definitely. a nice little synchronization of your uh, two different game plans. Yeah, 100%. I, I think that is the the key to, to tack ops is just making sure that they do 100% like fit into your game plan. As I said before, I play strategically aggressive, so I'm I'm putting people up into my opponent's zone. I'm forcing them off of their own objectives, and so at that point, I'm already close to their deployment zone. I'm you know kind of near their backfield and stuff like that, and that that allows me to score a lot of those tack ops. Uh, and then additionally, you know, with my sniper and my fly guy, I've got ways to to use the secure vantage tactical ploy that's like really far away from my my zones. 
Uh, and then also, I mean, if you're able to kind of like divide the board into a couple of lanes, which is kind of how I, I think about it, if you're able to clear a lane, you're pretty much able to, if you can get a spare operative in there, uh, you're pretty much able to just kind of score all of your tack ops on on recon for the most part. Because you've, if you're away from people, you've got space to put down a beacon. You've got space to uh, declare a courier and get close to your opponent's deployment zone. You've got, you know... You got a lot of them that you can score if you just clear a third of the board. So sometimes I, I go that route. And if I'm playing against like uh, Intercession or something like that, and they only put like one guy on one side of the board, you know, I'll start trying to bait them into one side and they start pulling all their operatives over. And then I just, you know, fly guy up the right side of the board that's now clear and, and I just get all my tack ops out of the way. And then I start worrying about, you know, coming back around and dealing with objectives. Yeah, that's definitely a very powerful way that you can abuse fly on open, where you can <laughs> really, really pull your opponent into a position where they can't really interact with you that quickly, which is nice. Oh, yeah. As you can probably yeah. tell, I, I uh, played a lot of Magic the Gathering. Yeah. <laughs> I I play a lot of Magic the Gathering, too. And hearing you talk about putting all of your pieces on different models so that there's no reliability on your fusion gun but you do have now a slightly less threatening leader but a more threatening player that kind of uh stacking of auras is and equipment is very common in magic the gathering <laughs> wide board states so i oh, know yeah, that yeah. feeling oh yeah have you ever gotten any good uses out of the shadow seers uh outside abilities outside of the mirror of minds because i know most people know mirror of minds as effectively the silent shooting attack but you know, he's got two other abilities that I think are very potent and players locally at Brooklyn have gotten some nice uses out of. What do you use on the Shadow Seer the most? And, you know, what are maybe some of the cooler plays that you've done with his psychic powers or okay. their psychic powers? I don't know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I did model all of mine uh, as as women and uh, I gave them custom 3D printed heads. So they have like a flat mask instead of like the clowny ones. Nice. And then they all have mohawks that are all like vibrant colors. So it's kind of like half Escher gang from Necromunda, half void dancers. Um, but yeah, so what I like to do is uh, I can't remember the abilities. I like off the top of my head. I know what they do, but I can't remember the names. Uh, but there's the one that basically forces somebody to operate later. And uh, that one's super handy on Into the Dark. If you can get line of sight on somebody who's like moved up and opened a door and they're getting ready to like, you know, lead a charge essentially next turn. Like they've set up a turning point two or turning point three, you know, just bad situation for you. Uh, I like to hit them with the one that forces them to, to activate later because if they're in, in front of the door and they're taking up too much space, especially if it's like a, a Marine or something like that, you can just keep everybody else from being able to move through that door buy yourself some time to get your grenade guy over there or get a torrent shot off or something like that. Uh, that's, that's the dirtiest play I've seen <laughs> with, with that specific ability. Or, you know, if you've got an opponent who at the end of the turn sets up an activation or something and gets to a point where it looks like they're going to, they're setting up something just anytime that you're able to have that kind of board state awareness and know that your opponent's setting something up, being able to, to freeze one of their operatives for a bit is just, it's devastating. Yeah, uh, I think one of the ways that I've seen Fog of Dreams get used a lot recently is to counter the resurgence of the Orc Commandos and their yeah. you know fancy dynamite plays. What you can do is steal first turn from them because if they want to do it, generally they have to be on Infiltrate unless they're going for the big brain play of scouting baits, but then they're not getting their dynamite. So to hedge on the dynamite, you can use Fog of Dreams to get you know, a lock on that model that's now within six inches of your deployment and then counter charge them. So they definitely cannot activate until your guys have gone up to go mess with him. So oh, that's, that's a fun way to do it. So for listeners who don't know, Fog of Dreams is one of the, the Shadow Seer's three psychic powers. And you basically select a visible enemy operative and visibility is just can your model's head see your opposing model, not any of the line of sight stuff. And then you, it gets stuck, basically stunned for D6 activations of your opponent's activations. So you can definitely stall out a, you know, maybe an orc boss with a piece of dynamite in front of your deployment. He can just get stuck there. Or, you know, a mutant that is trying to get in to turn into a torment. You can also stun them before uh, the demagogue turns them into a, a torment. Or after they get turned into a torment, they get stuck. So don't sleep on Fog of Dreams. But Definitely. have you used Veil of Tears in a fancy way? I'm just curious. Uh, that, that one's really... It's it's one of those where if I can kind of... 
again, you know, I divide the board into like three different sections, three different lanes. And so if I'm trying to like clear a lane off, but I have to, I have to commit somebody into a bad board position in order to like steal an objective or just kill an operative to keep them from, from, you know, pulling off their game plan. Then, yeah, I, I do rely on that one to be able to put myself in a bad position and then still be able to keep my person in cover, especially if I'm already using domino field because domino field combined with uh that ability which is veil of tears so veil of tears is you select a friendly that's visible to the shadow seer and then until the end of the turning point enemies cannot see them uh without them being in cover if they're more than six inches away which means that for domino field they just don't exist until you get within six after they get within six you are still you know it breaks through all of this stuff which is important and then opponents cannot charge those models unless they started within six inches of them. Mm-hmm. So that is actually a much better buff for someone who's trapped in an awkward spot at the beginning of a turn. Because you can have the Shadow Seer go, mirror of mind someone, then stop some guy from getting charged, which can be very, very powerful against the melee specific teams. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, that's really what I've relied on for it is just keeping, you know, or if, if, if I have to move somebody out into just like, just straight up the middle of the board in order to, you know, take care of an operative or, as I said, secure an objective. Uh, then, and I don't have any opponents nearby, and I'm or I'm killing an operative, and that's like the only one nearby, and my opponent's just relying on range to to kind of deal with that. Then, yeah, hitting them with Veil of Tears is is pretty solid. Uh, the other thing that I've really relied on it for is is securing the uh, the secure vantage tack op. If you're able to find a a high enough spot, you know, a vantage spot, and then get Veil of Tears on one of your operatives and just jump them up there and there's nobody around, then it's it's extremely annoying to try to try to stop that. Yeah, that's actually a good call out that putting Veil of Tears on someone getting onto a vantage means that it's just really, really hard to shoot at them, even if they're standing directly underneath them. It doesn't matter. Right? Yeah, exactly. And because of the fact that it's it's base to base, like people forget about that six inches is measure, measured, you know, direct. So, yes. so there's some situations where you can be really close, but you're still not close enough. Yeah, those are definitely some cool plays. I know, I know that you know locally the Shadow Seers have been popping off a lot more recently. We have a couple of dedicated Void Dancer players, so I was just curious about how your experiences were with them. Uh, any other cool plays that you wanted to call out? Any other uh, tricky plays that maybe you don't see too much on the internet, or do you feel like most of the salt mines of the void dancers have been thoroughly mined at this point yeah i think people kind of know what they're doing uh i I think you know because they've they were playing a pretty similar game plan before the white dwarf team came out and ever since the white dwarf team has been out for you know all the time that it has been i think people have kind of seen the stuff as i said there's not a lot of tricks and and things because your operatives don't have a ton of abilities which is nice. It's easy to remember, you know. I really only need to remember like a couple of different profiles. But yeah, when it comes to fancy plays and stuff like that, you know, that's that's about it. It's for me. It's all about just smart positioning and and uh, making sure that you don't get shot to death. Just curious, have you ever used the hallucinogenic grenade on the shadows here to any good effect? To be frank, I've I had kind of forgotten about it. <laughs> yeah, it's just for just for you know a niche tactic that uh you know a lot of people complain about these, um these models who can like see through walls and throw things. And the Shadow Seer actually does have one of these abilities. It's got the hallucin- hallucinogen grenade, which lets you select a point on the kill zone within six inches of this operative that doesn't have to be visible. So on open, you can throw it through a piece of Octarius terrain. Granted, you do get a debuff on the secondary effect, but. It is a stun grenade that is every operative within two inches of the point. So you, it's kind of like the normal stun grenades that other teams are getting, but it does come on your Shadow Seer, and it can do a mortal wound. So being able to chuck it through a wall and potentially stun a big clump of people, don't forget, you know, you don't. You've got your Shadow Seer. It can do two different silent attacks if it wants to. True, true. <laughs> yeah, that that is... That's a tricky one. It, it's one of those that, as I said, I kind of forget about unless I need to reduce, uh, unless I need to like reduce an a APL or something like that to steal an objective from like a space marine. You know, you can always you can get dirty with those types of tactics. But yeah, it's it's one of those where I'm like, my shadow seer is usually doing something else that to me is a little bit more valuable. But yeah, it's it's one of those. I'll, I'll have to play around with that a little bit and make some people salty. 
yeah, it's always good to know what your options are, even if it's not generally useful. The thing I always tell my newer players is you want to try everything, because if you have never tried any of it, you'll never know when you'll be like, oh, maybe I should do this thing. And True. a lot of people complain about the newer models who can chuck stuff through walls. And, you know, the Void Dancer troop also has something that can chuck something through a wall. Might not be as powerful as the Felgor uh, Toxin Bomb or the Demo Mine, which is not allowed to do it anymore. But it is nice to have those options, especially if you get stuck in an awkward defensive position where you don't actually want to move your Shadow Seer. You want them on a point. Maybe just chucking a grenade and then, you know, Mirror Minding someone can be useful. Yeah. So it's just totally. good, good to remember your options. Uh, were there any other like random small niches for your Corsairs that you've heard about or wanted to try or, you know, things that have done well locally at Texas that you wanted to call out? Uh, I mean, not really. Honestly, I, I, I've kind of I've gone over most of those things. I, I think I'm still kind of playing with them. They're they're my newest team. Uh, you know, I still don't even have them completely painted. Just got the Zenithal on them and uh, trying to find some time for that. But, uh, you know, they're. I'm still trying to to get all the tactics out. You know, right now I'm just kind of running up with all my melee people first to to kind of clear the objectives, and as I said, covering them with with long range operatives. I'm I went ahead and built like I got two kits and built everything out. I'm still playing around with the the leader, uh, what kind of loadout I want on him. Everybody says you know got to go with the neuro disruptor, but I'm like man, I I like having an infinite range shuriken rifle just in case I need to you know pop some people with some two pluses. And, you know, math wise, it doesn't really pan out like nearly as good. But, you know, whenever probability meets reality, uh, some crazy things happen. So, yeah, I've always been in the opinion that it probably should be on your roster at least. And then if the map calls for the ability to have another long range shooter, the leader is potentially one of those people that you don't want to risk because coordinated strike can do some really nasty stuff and keeping those sorts of abilities towards the end of the game can go a long way to not having you feel as static as you get to the end of the turns when you don't have as many models so yeah. having a neuro disruptor go up can pay huge dividends in the sense that like you know it is a really powerful gun you can charge and get a fight but it does give up some of your long range capability you know maybe your psyker isn't moving up if you do that which means he's not warp folding so there's always a push and pull Definitely. And if, as you talked about, like near the end of the game, especially since, you know, the entire team doesn't have fly like like Harlequins do. If your opponent has, you know, somebody mostly across the map and you've got, you know, just the neuro disruptor with a six inch range and you're doing a, a move and a dash and moving or moving around all of the terrain to get that shot, you know, sometimes you just can't make it happen. And that's always a feel bad moment whenever you end up in a situation where it's like, man, if I had two more inches and I could shoot at this guy, this one wound guy on an objective and keep you from winning the game, you know, and, and take the game, then, you know, I, I always try to think about those like weird corner cases of just like kind of standard play stuff, situational stuff. And that's why I tend to equip them with the rifle. But if you're doing the, the grenade tactic that I was talking about, you definitely want that neuro disruptor. Because if your opponent gets up in your face, that AP one shot is uh, pretty dirty. Yeah, it's definitely a better shot if you can use a shot reliably. It's just generally, I don't think the leader gets more than one shot with it, but you know, yeah. it's possible. <laughs> what what has been funny? Uh, again, not not necessarily a, a Corsairs thing, but a Void Dancer thing is uh, to kind of go back to them real quick. I did, uh, whenever you do the equipment, I, I choose the death mask and I always put it on my fusion pistol player because my fusion pistol goes in, you know, guns blazing, tries to delete somebody important and then, you know, does their job of dying. But the last about four or five games that I've played, I never got the death mask to pop off because my fusion pistol player somehow managed to survive the entire game, like until the, the entire game. And it, it sometimes would be the only operative on the entire board. <laughs> And I, I don't know how this is happening because it's one of those things where I anticipate them dying. So I'm putting them in dangerous situations. And my wife always tells me, you know, whenever I'm playing games, she's like, you got to be more aggressive. And I guess I just I did that with the fusion pistol. And, you know, I'm, I'm popping about two, three operatives, you know, a game with that one person. And then I don't get my CP. And I'm so sad. <laughs> he, he craves the sweet, sweet embrace of death. And sometimes <laughs> your opponents don't give it to him. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, and what sounds like, you know, we've talked a lot about the elves. Uh, Jason, if you want to toss in the last bit of Hand of the Archon elf bullshit before we uh, split for the day. It's been a while, but I... They're fun. They're cool. I played them at Adepticon, so that was a couple months ago, and I haven't really played them much since. Yeah, I mean, they can just hit you with a bunch of crits, and just, that's that's the whole thing to look out for. So if, you, if, you ha- if you're interested in Hand of the Archon, or if you're curious, it's basically all of their different combos synergize, where you're just going to very consistently and very reliably put three crits onto whoever you want. Um, yeah. Also, the fact that they have eight wounds and can have a six up feel no pain is going to mess up the breakpoint on damage like all over the place all the time. So they're very reliably going to take like one more hit than your enemy expects, and then that can often means they strike one more time, and that's just a huge game changer. That's pretty dirty. Do they also have a uh, bird operative? Everyone's got a bird. They yeah. do have a bird. It's... Yeah, if you're an elf, you've got to have a bird. Apparently. Yeah. It's a personal bird, though, compared to a oh. group bird. So on the Voidscar Corsairs, you get uh, the ability to turn someone on to engage for the rest of the turn. But for the Hand of the Archon, their bird only buffs the guy with the bird. The bird basically attacks him, and then he reveals it, and the guy can shoot at him. Yeah, and you can like use the bird as a silent, indirect attack. The bird just swoops yeah. over there and pecks at you with a couple of one-damage hits, maybe. Yeah, not, um, I wouldn't say yeah. it's super reliable, but it does have. It is a personal bird and not a group bird, which which can be gotcha. which is still yeah, fun. Injecting a little bit of uh, Alfred Hitchcock into the game, I guess. Yada. Okay. Well, <laughs> sounds like we're uh, getting to the end. So, in case Chase, you wanted to do any other final podcast shout outs, your socials, your local uh, team store, you know, just throw them up there. Tell us, All tell right. our listeners a little bit before we head out. Yeah, easy enough. Uh, so Clockwork Games is is our only game shop here in town, uh, but they've been huge. They've been very supportive of uh, our entire scene. Once we got like a consistent player base, they started stocking Kill Team products. Uh, and since it's a small store, whenever we get like Gallo Fall boxes or whatever, uh, they usually set one aside, and they'll ask if you know if anybody in our our group wants it before they kind of put it out for the rest of like the 40k players and stuff to buy, which is great because that means that kill team product is is actually going to the kill team players you know uh so there's there's them they've been wonderful uh aside from that like our local players ben and perry and dylan are you know know, just absolutely just star people they've they've helped me out tons whenever it comes to organizing tournaments uh my coworker uh jj james nicks uh, him and Dylan both came over like a week before LSO to help paint terrain, like way into the night. Um, my wife, who also helped assemble all of the terrain, <laughs> so it it would arrive in the mail, and uh, I would be you know cooking dinner or, or doing whatever, and she'd be over there on the 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 table in the living room just assembling all the terrain. So whenever I got done with whatever I was doing, she's like, "It's ready to paint," and I was like. Yes. Uh, she also came out to LSO and, and helps TO everything. Uh, she's got a good loud voice, so she helps kind of keep everybody on time with the call outs and such. Um, yeah. Uh, aside from that, uh, Dakota, with you know coming in clutch there at the end, giving me a lot of advice for how to run the tournament and uh, just giving us a ton of prize support and you know those trophies, as I said, things like that. Um, and then obviously, uh, kicker Kalazdi from FLG, uh, he's the events manager over there and just an absolutely wonderful guy and, you know, great to work with, great to communicate with. Um, yeah, I guess aside from that, uh, some other people, (laughs) uh, Rexer's lasers gave us some free terrain for the tournament. They're like a local, like MDF shop. And uh, I was like, hey, do you guys want to contribute some prize support? And they're like, here's a terrain set. <laughs> and <laughs> nice. I was like, well, yeah, okay. So we had an entire table just of their gear. And then uh, Enemy Spotted Studios is a miniatures company that that's run by veterans. And they're really good people. So they were actually there. I got to meet them. And they they asked if we wanted some, some prize support. And they gave us a whole like set of minis that really, really kick ass. Yeah, I think they're Thanks. from Minnesota. They are. Uh, if if you've met those folks, they're they're the best. Uh, 
highly recommend you look into their stuff. They've they've got some cool games and they play really fast and really simple on the rules. So I play that whenever I don't have time for guilty. <laughs> What's the uh, keyword for listeners today for their discounted just another kill team gauge from friend of the podcast Dakota of Luster's Workshop? We'll, we'll just go Lone Star. How does that work? Fine by us. Beautiful. Love it. So if you want that discount code, hop into the Discord, say Lone Star, and we'll make it happen. And uh, how do we get a link to your Discord? That will be in the podcast episode description. Beautiful. Well, I, I hope I see all y'all there. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Of course. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thanks for listeners, for, listeners. for uh, 